It was around two, 2006, seven, when my marriage failed, we lost our family home, um, investments, we, you know, lost everything and I had no money and only really a small part-time business at the time to keep myself afloat. And I mean, that was really freaky. And there were actually two really real low points. And one was when I walked out of the family home because I wanted to leave my husband at the time. And, um, but yeah, my kids were staying at home and I basically left them as well, you know, but I mean, they were 15 and 17 at the time, but still, I mean, that was probably the most painful place I've, I've ever been in, you know, everything. Yeah. I mean, that just, oh, you know, as a mom to leave her kids, it's like, just, it was killing me. And then the other one was when we actually then, um, my ex-husband was out of the picture. I was trying to, I was hustling to get the, the house on the market, you know, 2008. Sean Dustin spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud. Upon release in 2006, he had nothing but the clothes on his back, a bag of mail, and legal paperwork. In 2010, he kicked a long-time methamphetamine habit and started the long climb back up the ladder of life. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. If you want transparency and authenticity, you're in the right place. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and this is Sean Dustin. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and I'm your host, Sean Dustin. Today, I'm talking to Carolina Stevens. And Carolina uh, came to me by way of one of my posts for Bottoms and Life Struggles. And she wants to talk today about how she lost her home, marriage failed, lost all her money, uh, basically hitting rock bottom uh, by losing everything from what it sounds like. And now she's a life coach that, uh, you know, helps people kind of get out of their own way and help and, and to kind of live their best life. Would that be uh, correct in saying? Yeah, that's awesome. Sean, I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, coming today. And uh, I, I'm, I'm jealous because Sedona, Arizona is a beautiful place. Yeah, it's it's stunning. The red rocks and yeah, blue sky nearly every day is yeah, I love it. Yeah. So tell me, tell me a little bit about your story. Um, what brought you here? I know you said that you know my my podcast and the topics that I talk about uh, really resonate with you at some level. So uh, tell me about it. Okay, so. Um, yeah, you were talking about bottoms and, you know, a lot of people probably now in this period of time with the COVID-19 find themselves at the bottom. And, you know, they've been, their, their rug's been pulled from under their feet and they find themselves maybe with nothing or just, or in fear or being in situations, you know, stuck with families they don't really, they're not used to spending that much time with and, and so anyway, it just, it triggered in me my memory when I, when my rug was pulled from under my feet and how I rebuilt myself. And yeah, I mean, I would love to share the story because I think it can give hope to anybody that if it's possible for me, it's possible for anybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why we're here, right? You know, that's what, what this podcast is about. That's what uh, being a life coach is about, uh, is, is, you know, uh, helping people to, you know, uh, express themselves uh, so that they are actually living their, their authentic lives, right? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, okay, well, let me just share my story. So, yeah, it was around two, 2006, seven when my marriage failed, we lost our family home, um, investments, you know, lost everything and I had no money and only really a small part-time business at the time to keep myself afloat. And I mean, that was really freaky. And there were actually two really real low points. And one was when I walked out of the family home 
because I wanted to leave my husband at the time. And, um, but yeah, my kids were staying at home and I basically left them as well, you know, but I mean, they were 15 and 17 at the time, but still, I mean, that was probably the most painful place I've, I've ever been in, you know, everything. Yeah. I mean, that just, oh, you know, as a mom to leave her kids, it's like, just, it was killing me. And then the other one was when we actually then, um, my ex-husband was out of the picture. I was trying to, I was hustling to get the, the house on the market, you know, 2008. Um, you know, everything was falling apart and, um, our house, the value was going down. And, um, yeah, I got it ready, got it for sale, I got it cleaned up, handed the keys over. And I was so busy, I hadn't even thought about where we're going to live after that. And so <laughs> it was one of my sons, our dog, our cat. And we, were, we left the home and we're going like, oh, my gosh, where are we going to go now? You know, so that was another one of those. Yeah, just total unknown. Everything that's ever been secure yeah was gone and so I, I called some friends up and they were you know they had a spacious home and they were thank goodness they were generous enough to let us stay there for a week until we could get on to on our feet and um, start to yeah start to pick up where we kind of left off but yeah with regards to this whole story of losing everything you know I was kind of like blaming the economy I was blaming my ex-husband blaming myself and that's when a friend came to me and he kind of put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Carolina, what you have created is because of your way of thinking and your way of being. And all you need to do is change those and you can create something different. And so initially it was like, whoa, you know, um, yeah, I have to stop blaming people and stuff, but it, it rang true with a deeper part inside of myself and, and it gave, gave me hope. And I went like, okay, if this is how life works, I'm going to prove it to myself. And so that's when I rolled up my sleeves and I got to work. And so I, I threw every cent I had at, at healing practitioners, at coaches to help them it, um, it really turned my subconscious inside out because obviously consciously I wouldn't have created something like this. And so, and it was shocking because I had no clue of the disempowering emotions, uh, you know, pa past pain that I was still holding on to, grudges, resentments, fears, insecurities, and also beliefs. You know, I'm not good enough. Women are second rate citizens. You know, um, men can't be trusted. Life's a struggle. And, you know, on and on and on and on. And so, um, yeah, as I went through the process, just really focusing on um, facing my fears and insecurities, healing my childhood wounds, forgiving a bunch of people. Um, yeah, that's when all of a sudden... I started to feel more comfortable in myself, more empowered. And that's when life started to mirror my new empowered consciousness back to me in the form of, you know, greater opportunities. I was building my business at the time. I was working with a life coach and all of a sudden, you know, my, my business was growing. I was getting opportunities. My income was growing. My, my relationships became more authentic and real because I was and, um, and life started to flow more easily, you know? And so I really got it that one of the quotes comes, comes to mind is in life, we don't get what we want. In life, we get what we are. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, yeah, from that time now, I went like, whoa. And so then four years later, I met the love of my life in Phoenix and, and now live my dream life in Sedona. And yeah. So anyway, that's, that's sort of my story from hitting rock bottom to living my dream. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, you, you started out in New Zealand, right? <clears throat> that's where your story well, started. Yeah, yeah. Originally, I'm from Germany. Just you know, so you, people know where my funky accent's from. And, so, <laughs> and then ended up in New Zealand. Lived there for nearly 19 years. Yeah, uh, the one thing that that uh, that you said that uh, you know you felt like uh, like a, a stigma or stereotype is that you know women are second class citizens, um, and you know you were living on the other side of the world for you know probably a better part of your life, right? 
Mm-hmm. So, did, would you would you would you say that this is a fair um, statement that in in the United States? that's i mean other than what you hear in the news and the media and everything else about equal rights equal pay and all that other stuff but i mean do, do you feel like women are looked at a little bit more respectfully in in our culture versus uh other cultures on the other side of the world or is it kind of like the same um i think it it depends on your upbringing it depends on the culture you grow grew up in it depends on the relationship that your mom and dad may have shared and on the the beliefs that you picked up. How did your dad treat your mom? You know, how did your mom treat your dad? And because when we are little, we pick up, you know, we learn from the, they were our first role models and we learn from them, you know, what it's like to be a woman and what it's like to be a man. And in Germany, the way I grew up, it was very male dominated and the man was like the superior species on all levels. And I didn't have, I couldn't rationalize that it was just my dad and the way he grew up, etc. And I love him. So there's no issue anymore now, but that was just the way he, yeah, he was. And, and I think there's probably plenty of kind of redneck mentality where this is the same thing in, yeah, in the yeah. US, in, in all over the world. And yeah. there's also enlightened, more enlightened people that, that are getting it, that we're literally, we're souls and we're all the same. We're equal and, um, need to learn to treat ourselves and each other. You know, with respect and regard and yeah. Yeah. Well, as I start, as I, as I rethought about what I had just said, um, or the question that I had asked, um, I mean, I, I guess we could see that here in, in, in the States as well, but just in, you know, you have, you have, you know, certain areas, you know, like the, the further, the, the closer you are to a city, like a, a major metropolitan city, like San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, New York City, uh, the closer you get to those seems to be the more enlightened, enlightened people are just because the, the, the access to information and people that are talking about information is more readily available, right? Versus if you go somewhere, uh, let's say, um, oh God, what do I, somewhere ur- not urban, but, uh, like, you know, where there's not a lot of people, it's not densely populated and, you know, podcasting isn't popular. People aren't talking, uh, there's no buzz about much because, you know what I mean? Their 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 life their lifestyles are so much uh, slower. You know, and so um, yeah, it's it's a great point. I'm just thinking. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I, I it was, just broke up. So. Yeah, there's a there's definitely a lag here. <laughs> there's a there's a a lag in in between when you hear it and and I'm and I'm seeing you respond to it. So yeah, I. Just, uh, just curious on that. Um, okay. Uh, well, I don't have that much experience with different places in the U.S. I've been living here, and Sona, Sedona is a fairly kind of like new age kind of a place. I mean, it's got a lot of people coming from all over the world for personal development, for healing, you know, for lots of different things. But so there, it's it's like a higher vibe kind of a place but at the same time the people I work with they can come from any kind of socioeconomic um, strata or any kind of um, jobs or career CEOs lawyers whatever or you know like just you know ordinary workers and the same issues can be there because the thing is when we are hurt as children when we grow up maybe with you know violence in the home when we grow up with an absentee parent then yeah the things that we are learning we are going to probably going to repeat unless we become conscious we do healing work and we we start to work on our consciousness yeah, that's just how it is. We're going to replay the record. That's what I see with my clients. And at some stage, we come to a point where the, what we've been doing is not working anymore. Like something falls apart, you know, our health or our losing everything or relationship 
or everything all together. Yeah, yeah. And then that's like the wake up call. And I know you've experienced, you know, wake up call too, mm-hmm. where, where it was like, whoa, what I'm doing is not working anymore. And that's really where it's the invitation to start living consciously to break those legacies to our past and to, um, yeah, empower ourselves to live authentic lives. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. Um, it, uh, you know, it's not, I mean, I, and not everybody is, uh, I don't know. How do I want to say this without saying, sounding like an asshole? Um, not everybody is, uh, just alert, you know, of, of themselves. I feel like a lot of people go through life, um, and I was just talking to this with, with a friend of mine, uh, not too long ago, uh, people that just go through life and they're just being themselves or, 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 you know, who they really are, but, but they're so, uh, a, such a destructive, uh, force out there because they, they have bad behavior that, that like, they're not even aware of that they're doing right. And we, and we all know these people in our life, you know, that we, we call them toxic people, right? Um, where they don't know how, you know, they're not aware of the behavior that they're displaying to the rest of the world or how they're presenting to the rest of the world, you know, cause there's, and I used to be this way too. And I've said this before that, you know, you're, you're, you could go into a room full of light and be the, the, the thing that comes in and darkens everything. You know, you, you're, you're so, uh, uh, it, it, it's such a, um, chore to deal with you and your personality and everything that comes with, with being around you that you exhaust everybody in your, that, that you come into contact with. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally, I can totally relate. And, um, I mean, I believe from my work that there are no bad people. I mean, there's only people that have unhealthy behaviors. There are only people, those are the people that are hurting. You know, they are acting out their, still their childhood wounds. And, and they still have those compensating behaviors, which they have adopted maybe when they were a kid and they've had this big void. There was no love. There was no guidance. They were scared shitless because there was violence about the, around them. And they're starting to develop behaviors just to, to get through life, to cope, you know? And, and yeah, and they're often what happens too. They are on this constant stress level. There's this chronic, low level or high level stress and what sort of science is proving is that when we grow up like this then we often we get addicted to stress and we keep putting ourselves in stressful situations we keep creating stressful situations because that's what we know that's kind of what we feel comfortable with and um and yeah and that's unconscious behavior that's all it is it's we grow up in a certain way and we just we just keep doing what we've learned and we are unconscious, you know, and I certainly was for most of my life until I hit the sort of, um, wake up call and was forced to wake up. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that awakening is pretty, uh, it it can be pretty, pretty jolting. Uh, you know, some of the ones that I've had for sure. Uh, and you know, and I'm not even just talking about the, like the drug, parts of my life, you know, that though, that's, you know, that was, to me, that was, that wasn't nearly as difficult to deal with and get through as trying to reprogram my behavior, uh, because of what exactly what you just said, because of the, the behaviors that I had learned along the way of whatever it was I was doing to, to get to my destination. Um, you know, it was like, all right, well, here's some, here's one thing that starts working for you. Now you've adopted that into, uh, you know, one of your defense mechanisms or your, your offense mechanisms or whatever you do to survive how the, the situation. And so you're picking up these tools i mean they're actually tools for you but they're 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 being applied in in uh uh not correct manners right you're applying them in a, in a way that's not uh productive for anybody you know yourself anybody you come in contact with uh, so you um 
Yeah, and so you just uh, you know, by the time you're you get to a point where you have all of these negative tools that you've been using to get through life, it's weighing you down because those are heavy tools, right? It, I mean, the how you figured out how, like for me how to navigate and mani- manipulate people through uh making you feel bad, guilty, however it was that I was going through life and and doing to other people uh, that, that baggage starts to become heavy at some point. Right. Oh, totally. And, and it's like, all right, well now I can't move anymore and I'm paralyzed from my own behavior. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have no choice, but to, uh, and, and really, uh, for lack of a better word, not to plug my, my thing, but I mean, you have nowhere to go, but up because now you you're stuck and your behavior has brought you to a place, um, that you can no longer function in because we're in a different, I mean, we're honestly, we're in a different world. And actually the, for me, it was that behavior worked in a world over here of criminality Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, drug addiction and, and drug addicts and dealing with other drug addicts that when you come into the real world, you know, when you're having to deal with professional people day to day, you have a job, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're in a in 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 the real world, so to say, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that behavior starts to clash with the world around you, mm-hmm. right? And so you have no choice but to look at it and go, "All right, well, something has to change." Uh, you know, mm-hmm. that was very long winded. I I know. I just I kind of I kind of got lost uh, in in one of the places, and so I was like doing a doing a U turn real quick to try to find my way, and maybe I went somewhere else. I don't know. No, that's cool. Um, And the thing is, you know, we always have a choice, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people out there and I used to be one of them who used to point the finger at other people, you know, it's his fault, it's her fault, it's their fault. And we can go can go through life for quite a while that way or always having to be right or yeah, manipulating people to get what we want. But yeah, at some stage, it just stops working or we become present to the pain that it's costing us, ruining our relationships, you know, just our career, yeah, losing everything. And and then we have the choice. Life gives us an opportunity whether we want to, yeah, go up and rise and up level our state of consciousness instead of being in face ourselves. And that's a sc- scary place, Sean, because for a lot of people, there's a lot of pain there beneath the surface. And we've kind of built this mask, you know, that we, we show to the world, like I've got it all together. And, but beneath it, there's often there's so much pain there from the past. And, and it's scary to, to just open up and, and start to, to deal with it and look at it and I get this but the thing is when we do it the the results are priceless because all those wounds and all this pain is not who you really are you know actually beneath that pain there is the real you it's like that that authentic deeper place where there's wholeness where there's peace where there's joy where there's resourcefulness and where everything is already there it's just when stuff happened, you know, for example, I don't know, somebody abuses you and you go like, I must be a bad person or I'm worthy, worthless. Um, I'm a piece of shit. I'm, you know, or, you know, some, nobody takes care of you. You're neglected. You know, I'm, you know, I'm nobody. Nobody loves me. And so we take on board all those beliefs and we start to believe that they are the truth. And we forget about that there's actually this wholeness place inside of us, you know. And so then we start to live from those beliefs and from the pain and start to keep proving ourselves right. We start to do bad things, you know, to prove ourselves right. Yes, I am a bad person or I am attracting the people that treat you badly. Yeah, I am worthless or, you know, like we recreating constantly according to our beliefs. And this is also um, one of the things I learned is that we are the creators of our own reality and life is just the mirror that reflects back to us what's going on inside of us. And so when we take off the lid and actually start to look inside and and release that pain, you face it, release it, empower the beliefs, let go of the inner critic voice and 
men, then all of a sudden, you know, life, you attract different people, you attract different, and you must, must have experienced that, right? You know, when you up level your mindset and how you're operating in life, your behaviors, then life starts to show it dif differently. Yeah, uh, it, it, you're, you're right. It, it does. Um, I, I believe that, uh, I don't, I don't necessarily believe like, I mean, I know like the law of attraction at one point in time when I saw that, when I saw that movie, the law of attraction, right? I'm sure you've seen it or mm -hmm. read the book. Um, I, I, I absolutely like was like sold on it. Right. You know, because there's, there's certain things that, that happen in life, uh, you know, through whatever, whatever means that you want to, uh, to say, you know, once your mind becomes, uh, uh, so focused on something, right. And it's mm -hmm. all, it, it, there's something that's at the front of your mind all the time. All right. I need to do this. This is what I want to do. I've, you know, you've committed to, to making the change or you committed to, let's say you learning something or, you know, you've, whatever it, you've gone all in, I'm going, I'm all in on this. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden now you, you, you've got conviction in what it is you're trying to do. You have intention on, on what it is that you want. Uh, you're talking about it all the time. It's at the front of your mind all the time because it's all, all that you want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then at some point, just you're more aware of the opportunities around you that are surrounded by this thing that you want to do or get involved in. And so you're, you're, uh, you, you're more in tune with, with, uh, what it is that you're doing, I guess was what I'm trying to say. And opportunities start, start presenting themselves, but you're aware of what it is. You know what I mean? Because if you weren't aware of what it was that you were, that you wanted and you weren't intentional about what, where it was you were going, uh, you would not be aware of these opportunities, right? Does that, does that sure. make any sense? Cause it, it did in my head, but then it, when, when I said it, 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 it started not to. <laughs> no, totally. I mean, what you, no, totally. What you focus on grows. And if you're focusing on what you want to do on your intentions and you learn, yeah, or learn all about it. And then your, your brain is going to tick, 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 and it's starting to check out. Um, it's starting to filter all the input that comes in for something that matches that. Yeah. So that's, uh, totally. Um, but sometimes what happens is even though we're focusing on something and we put in all our energy, all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't work out or we sabotage ourselves or we don't um, show up. We don't stick to our commitment to ourselves. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> yeah, all the time. It happened to me uh, just uh, earlier when I had lunch. I, I had pizza for lunch, which is, you know, and I've been just complaining about my, my weight and, and everything else. And I just talked to a nutritionist before you and we were talking about gluten and how that's bad for you and inflammation. And I, you know, I knew I was going to get pizza for lunch, but I was like, I, I didn't dare say it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the point I want to make is that, you know, with all the stuff that we adopt as children, it, it, it doesn't just go away. It becomes this undercurrent that starts to run our lives. And they are those beliefs and those thoughts and emotions. They are the silent saboteurs that even though we consciously know what we need to do, they derail us and we suddenly hit some different direction or they, yeah, they make us do the things or say the things to people that we go like, oh my gosh, I, I wish I hadn't said that. I really didn't want to say this. But, you know, there's this this little inner voice in there that, I mean, can you relate? Yeah, well, I mean, it, and in some cases it even goes deeper than that, right? Because you have intergenerational trauma that follows uh, family members, right? Totally, totally. And I, I didn't, I didn't really... I didn't think that that was a real thing. I mean, well, first of all, I didn't know that it was a thing. And then when I, when some, I interviewed somebody who was talking about it, I was, I started to like go, mm, you know, and, and then I really had to stop and think about it. And I'm going, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I guess that, I guess that would make sense. I mean, you have, you have animals in, in the animal kingdom that don't know how to, like they, they, they start doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, but nobody showed them how to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's, it's that blueprint that's hardwired into their DNA that tells them that this is what you need to be doing. Right. 
Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I can totally see that how that would, that could possibly be that if you are a Holocaust survivor, you know what I mean? That you, you've got some, some trauma there, right? Some serious, serious trauma, uh, that maybe, you know, gave you a lot of anxiety or, um, you know, or whatever, whatever that, that situation caused for you, right? And then your offspring now, are prone to anxiety, uh, mental health, or, or there's something that, that, that transfers there, you know? And yeah. that, and that, that's a real thing too. And so if you have that and then on top of, you know, being raised in a, in a situation that's not, that's not healthy, like I, I was, um, you know, and you just act out what, you know, what, what it was that, uh, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy, I guess you could say that, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I mean, that's what this whole thing about generational trauma is also about that. My guess is that your grandparents and the grandparents before that, they already lived those kind of dynamics to some degree, and they got handed on to the next generation to the next generation, and then to you, you know, yeah. and um, yeah, and so then it just gets perpetuated unless we wake up and we consciously when we stop being on autopilot and we take our power back. Yeah. I know my grandparents went through the great depression, uh, that, that time period. And, uh, I kind of can't really remember where they, where they were. Um, but, but I do know that my dad, uh, hoards food now. Like, you know what I mean? He's got three freezers full of vacuum sealed, uh, (laughs) I mean, it's ridiculous how many, how, like he's got two at his house, two or three at his house. He has another freezer at, at his work and it's just like all filled with food. And I was, and I think that that comes from, you know, my grandparents having gone through that time period where there wasn't enough. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can kind of understand it. Can't yeah. you? I mean, yeah, yeah. And logically, Logically, those things don't make sense because we live in, in, in abundance at this point in time, most of us. But then when we go beneath the surface, we see that there is still maybe a kid there that's, that's panicking. There was not enough food there that we, you know, you just got one meal a day or whatever, you know, and then the undercurrent just keeps on going and drives us in our behaviors. You know, but the thing is, we don't have to keep living like this. We can actually heal those kind of things. We can um, cut those generational ties. I mean, my families, I mean, they came from, you know, my granddad, World War One, and then my dad was born right at the beginning of World War Two. And so, so there's a lot of war trauma and, and again, not having enough struggle and then rebuilding and doing, doing, doing and overcompensating for all the trauma by being efficient and, you know, like German being very super efficient and productive and, you know, and yeah. And then as a kid, you grow up in this energy and you just absorb it by osmosis and then naturally do those things you don't even know why you are that way but it's just how you've grown up and what you've absorbed you know yeah it's really it's really difficult to be a person (laughs) (laughs) yeah i know it's a crazy thing you know ultimately we are and that's what all the the saints and the sages say you know you are this this wholeness, this peace, this beauty, you are this greatness. Yeah. But then we come into the world and we come into situations that are just totally traumatizing. Then we then we build up all those layers of trauma and of all the stuff. And then we have to spend the rest of our lives trying to peel those layers off and trying to get back to this place of wholeness. You know, it's a crazy game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's exactly what it seems like a, a crazy game with a lot of different layers, uh, you know, to peel through. And you know, the situation that we're in right now is going to cause cause a lot of uh, a lot of trauma if it hasn't if it hasn't already. I mean, I, and I think that this is the first portion of the problem as people are 
are stuck at home and, you know, the traumatic situations that are, are happening, you know, with people that are, uh, you know, stuck in bad relationships and abusive relationships, uh, you know, drug addicts that are, are, you know, isolated from, from thing and getting worse. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are going to happen on that end of it. But then not only that, we have the, we have the back end of this thing, which nobody even knows what the outcome of that's going to be, uh, you know, and what that's going to look like yet. Um, and, and, you know, how many, how many people are going to be financially impacted that will, will further cause, uh, uh, emotional damage and, you know, possibly, uh, human life harm, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's a very challenging, um, situation. I mean, to also be in the unknown. I mean, no, none of us, this is a situation that's never happened before. None of us knows what's going to happen and and as humans we're kind of wired we want to know so we can protect ourselves and we can make plans and we can hoard food if we need to (laughs) and yeah and um yeah and so that brings up a lot of fear so there's a lot of fear right now you know in in a lot of people and yeah and a lot of trauma and uh, already on trauma you know like a lot of people they've kind of just been able to go and make their make their ends meet and from day to day but now boom all of this is gone so so yeah i mean it's obviously a time who huge challenging time but i also believe like in your situation and in my situation that when we hit rock bottom that it's also um an opportunity to look at things from a total different angle to rebuild differently i mean we have to and nothing of those things have been working for a long time anyway you know and it's time to get real and to um yeah not not just from power based and we have our own agendas and but you actually start to care for people and start to um, support each other and collaborate rather. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the new bright new world. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was, I was, I was saying that, that, you know, now's a good time to, uh, you know, um, if you like, if you live in a neighborhood, right, you've got, you've got a neighborhood, um, you know, let's say you've, uh, you know, got like maybe 40 neighbors, let's say 40 neighbors, right. Uh, you know, of course, we're going to have to pay the the bills, like the mortgage, the, uh, the 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 stuff that actually has to get paid. But I mean, we can do other things uh, as a as a as a community because I mean, that's really the closest community. That I mean, that is your community. Your neighborhood is your community. Then it goes out a little bit further into the city, you know, which is your city, and then it goes out into your county, which is your county. But being able to have the most effect in your own neighborhood where you spend most of your time is probably a better, a, a better, you know, a, a, a better way to spend your time, I, I would say. And so I, I was thinking that, you know, why don't people start, you know, if you want to start a good thing is stop growing your own food, right? Growing your own vegetables and your own fruit, right? Why don't you start a co-op in your neighborhood? Uh, you know, assign, assign a vegetable to, you know, all your neighbors get together. They want to participate in this. Assign somebody in a vegetable. All right. Well, you grow X amount of, of carrots and you grow X amount of whatever. And then it kind of brings people together. You know what I mean? To share, share in, in a commonality, right? You're, you're helping to provide food. Uh, fresh food, uh, good food for, for yourself and your neighbors. And then take it a step further out, outside of that. You know, if you have a, a skill, if you're a carpenter, you know, to build things. If you're a painter, you know, to paint stuff. Uh, and you, maybe you have somebody in your neighborhood that's a tax person and knows how to, you know, can, can do your taxes. Somebody else that can, you know, help you financial plan, right? Or someone can cut hair. Uh, start bartering these, these, uh, uh, services to help save yourself some money, you know, and by yeah. that you're helping to build your community. I think that's, that's great. I think that's, yeah, that's awesome. And actually in New Zealand, I was part of a barter kind of community and, and I used, because I was a stay at home mom. And so I, I didn't go out and work uh, at the time. And so, yeah, I, I could bake muffins and I could make food and I could give tennis lessons and I could do healing sessions or whatever it was. And people came and trimmed my trees and did this and that. And yeah, I think that's a, that's a great, um, 
yeah it's a gr great idea and it also it, it, i mean right now we are very virtually oriented and for a lot of us the community is out there someplace and my family is literally spread all over the globe um but yeah i think it's it's great to come back and actually i was in an earthquake in 2011 in christchurch and um and one of the good things i mean it was devastating you know 186 or something people got killed 11 people i worked with got killed and i mean geez it was devastating but the light the 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 um the good thing that came out of it was that people because they had no electricity so their their um their food they had to empty their freezers so they had barbecues everywhere in the neighborhood and they were you know barbecuing their their meat and stuff and sharing it with their neighbors and there were had water some people had water some people didn't and so yeah so there was this amazing sense of getting together to actually stop while you're picking up water, your water and you're talking to people which you never did and yeah, that's exactly what you were talking about. You're sharing resources and you supporting each other. You check in on the other. And but it seems like it's so crazy. We need disasters to make that happen. You know. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. Why why wait for a, 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 another disaster uh, to to make that happen? You know, it, it's something that you can do today or not today but as soon as we get off of this and we're a little bit uh and no no you still can do it today in your neighborhood i mean i neighbors some neighbors are going over to neighbors houses or at least to the to the you know the the front you know, maybe not going in, but people are going to their front and saying hello and, you know, their social distancing within six feet. I mean, you know, if you got your mask on or, or whatever, it's still possible. Um, sure. you know, and, and it, 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 I think it's a good way to, to plant the seed because who knows what's going to happen down the road, right? I mean, I, did you ever in a million years think that, that the economies of the world would be shut down? Well, no. <laughs> that all, never that never yeah. even seemed like a possibility, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, and and here we are, right? And, and so, I mean, why wait until another disaster to be self-sufficient and to be at one with your community where your community is self-sufficient, you know what I mean? And each community should start getting together like that so they're self-sufficient, you know? And if, you know, something big down the road ever did happen, at least there would be, you know, some relief within within the community already and it's not like you're starting from zero having to go and introduce yourself hey i need help we're, we're start we're hungry we're starving you know hmm. yeah absolutely totally agree and and right and, and this crazy thing is is that the, that you know a lot of the people because of this uh you know would always look at the people that you know uh, oh, those, those people are always, you know, always in harm's way. You know, they're, it, whenever something happens, it, it, you know, the, they're, it's, they're the ones that are always suffering. Well, some of those people are actually on that side of the fence right now. You know, the ones that never thought that, that they would see themselves, uh, you know, almost in bankruptcy, having to have their houses foreclosed on, uh, you know, because they, they fell, you know, whatever victim to whatever these lending practices that we're going through right now, where there's really no relief, right? It's, uh, you know, you're, you're prolonging the inevitable. If you couldn't, you know, if you're not working, you can't afford to pay for anything, mm. you know? So, uh, I don't know. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> that's just uh, some of, some of my, yeah, some of I, my I crazy yeah, conspiracy totally. started coming through there. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's great, and it's great to to plan ahead and um, and and be aware, and not wait until the last hour, you know, which we kind of have done in terms of globally, in terms of the way the Earth is and and climate change and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, every moment is a new opportunity where we can make changes, changes inside of ourselves as well as changes, um, yeah, in our community and. Yeah, don't don't wait for your governments to to step in and 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 save you from something. You know, be proactive. You know, do it yourself. Figure it out. You know, be reliant on 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 yourself and 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 others. You know, I think I think that uh, it would be a really nice thing if when we came out of this that you know community the sense of community w was something that didn't just. Uh, be something of nostalgia you know it it, it 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 is here and it was here to stay for a while 
Yeah, totally. And community is actually one of the pillars of mental health, you know, to have connection, to have people that support you and that you can support. I mean, that is, it's really important for our mental health. Yeah. yeah. Amongst other things, but that's one of those things. Yeah, for sure. Well, we are at, uh, that time right now. Uh, if you want to plug any of your, your places, your spaces, anywhere you're at online, your coaching business, uh, you know, what, whatever you want to, whatever you want to promote for yourself, go ahead and do it right now. Okay. Well, um, yeah, if you feel you're, you're frustrated with where you are, where you, if you feel like p old pain is being triggered and you don't know what to do with it, really my message is you can heal this and you can, um, you can empower yourself. And so the, one of the healing modalities I use is called the journey and it helps you right go to the root cause in a very gentle way to help um, let go of your past trauma, you know, of your generational trauma, of your childhood wounds. So you can actually tap back into the wholeness you are, into your natural empowerment. Because, yeah, if you let go of stress, um, then your mind starts working differently. You see opportunities and you're much more resourceful. You're much more creative than when you're just on the edge struggling. And so this is what I want to offer. And I want to offer anybody who's struggling right now, just even a 20 minute free conversation with me. And, um, it'll be, the link will be in the, in the show notes. And, you know, there's no, it's no sales. It's just as a support, you know, that's something I can offer. And, you know, please, um, take this opportunity to stop and, and also look within. And I mean, there's, there's, you've got so much going for you. And, uh, yeah, you can turn this around for yourself, but you may need some help. And, you know, if you want to talk about it, I'm, i you can find me on Instagram. Um, yeah, I've got a website. I'm on Facebook. So I'd love to have a conversation and love to support you on your journey to greater empowerment and to creating something that is meaningful to you and, um, yeah, the living your purpose and, and creating healthy empowering relationships and and an abundant life i mean you can if i can do it so can you and that's really my my message don't let your past hijack your future well that's perfectly said and i couldn't have said it better myself so uh, i want to thank you carolina uh for your time today uh and uh spreading your message and taking the time to have a little chat with me that was awesome sean i really enjoyed it thanks for that You've been listening to the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. Sean is a single dad, a union blue collar guy, and he spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud. When he was released from prison in 2006, all he had was the clothes on his back, a bag of mail, and some paperwork. Since then, he's turned his life around and shares the struggles and successes on this podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we hope you were moved to connect to the show. Book a guest spot. For merch, Patreon, PayPal, and social media links, go to linktr.ee slash nowhere to go but up. On Instagram at nowhere to go but up now. On Twitter at but up now. On the YouTube channel at nowhere to go but up podcast. See you next time.